Um, it is great um, to be back up here um, on stage. I had originally planned on preaching in June, but it turns out it is a lot harder to unwind 13 years in a city than I'd planned on. Um, but I am so grateful for everyone who spoke um, during the past few weeks. Um, you killed it. I was just so proud of everyone. Um, can we turn the lights down just a little bit on me so I can see the people in the audience? I really, it feels like I'm talking to myself, which is fine. I can, I do that all the time. Um, So I have been tasked with uh, my final sermon with also closing up a series um, where we've walked through our five values as a church, and then we broke down our mission statement. Now, if this is your first Sunday here, or if by chance you slept through the series, um, or you've been on vacation, let me recap our values. As a church, the first thing we the first value is that we love God. It is our love of God that propels us forward. It is our love of God that that gives energy to everything we do. But our second value is that we love people because we believe that our love for God is validated by the way we love people. The way that we are judged in our love for for God is the way that we love God's children, the way that we love other people. Next, we pursue excellence. And by that, we do not mean perfectionism, but instead we mean that we are constantly growing. We are constantly being stretched. We are constantly becoming who God created us to be. Next, we have fun. We like to laugh and to be irreverent and goofy. And we live life generously. And for us, these values sum up who, sum up what the culture of our church. And culture is the way a company or a people behave and do life. And so that we hope if an anthropologist a hundred years from now was doing, doing an ethnography of our church, that they'd say things like this, that this community was defined by their love of God and their love of people. They were always growing. They liked to laugh and have a good time. And they lived generously. See, because culture is not what you say. Culture is how you live. And so that's what we hope to capture in these statements. But then over the past few weeks, we've been breaking down our mission statement, which is this, that the reason that we exist, our why is that the table exists to call people to become authentic and thoughtful followers of Jesus, to join God in the renewal of all things. And so I've been tasked with wrapping up this series with a challenge, or with ending this this, this mission statement. I've been tasked with the challenge of going, of joining God in the renewal of all things. Because the gospel of Jesus always calls us out Christianity is not an inward religion. There are religions that are all about the internal, about perfecting yourself, about becoming you know, a higher state of consciousness or being or whatever that might be. And while Christianity calls us to be something different, Christianity is ultimately a religion that compels us outward. The inner work we do is for the sake of the world. So here's what I want to do this morning. I, w- I want to give you a quick roadmap of where I'm going because it might seem a bit confusing. I want to just share some of the emotions that I'm having as I look towards the future. Some of my emotions about leaving, however stunted they might be. I want to share a quick word of encouragement in regards to one of those emotions. And then I just have a few challenges and charges for Um, on the type of community I hope the table will continue to be. And then we'll wrap things up and tie it, I hope, tie everything together. Does that sound good? I can't see you, so you're going to have to speak affirmatively. I literally cannot see it. This is just just a black sea. I can see Jess's white pants. And it's hard to believe that this is my final sermon at the Table Church. Over the past few weeks, I've had all sorts of emotion. 
There's been moments of incredible pride. For example, when I listened to Pastor Jessica give her first sermon last week. Did she not do such an amazing job? Can we give her a round of applause? Or at All In Night, as I listened to Alexis Banks and Steph Kuma give testimonies about service, they killed it, both of you. Where are you, Steph? You did such a good job. I don't think, I think Alexis is just in the evening service. But Alec, Steph, you did such an incredible job. I was so proud as I worshipped with 50 of our leaders and just felt such an incredible move of God's spirit in that space on Wednesday evening. I felt incredible pride about what this community has become, but also about what I see it becoming. The thing that I will always be most proud of is the leaders that I leave behind. And I believe, you need to hear me, I believe with all of my heart that the best is yet to come for the table, church. The things that God is going to do in and through you are going to be more amazing than anything you could ever ask or imagine your mind is going to be blown at what God is going to do. I believe that with all my heart because I believe that God has called the table church for such a time as this. I believe we inhabit a unique space in the religious landscape and our church is needed more now than ever. There have also been moments of excitement and hope. I am a person who is terrible at reflection and looking at the past. I also am really poor at being in the present. I'm always looking around the next bend. What is next? And so I'm really excited about the next stage of life. I'm excited to follow the dreams that God has been birthing in me for a long time. Because one of the things I'm realizing about myself is that God created me to be an entrepreneur. And entrepreneurs give birth to things. In fact, I've told you this but I never really considered myself a pastor. The, the, the only mantle that I would consider is really a spiritual entrepreneur. And God gave me a vision for doing church differently, and I leaned into it with all that I have. And the thing about giving birth, and mothers know this, that the thing about giving birth is that it's painful, but it's also one of the most rewarding things in life that you can ever do. So I'm excited about birthing new dreams that God has placed in my heart. There have also been moments of incredible sadness and tears. I'm so sad about leaving this incredible community. You are some of the most amazing people that I've ever had the privilege of knowing. One of those moments of sadness came a couple weeks ago. Um, Charla and Eloise and I had gone to Cuspa, which is an Indian restaurant, Um, It's one of our favorite Indian restaurants um, in the city. It's on 8th Street Northeast. And it happens to be one block down from the first building we ever met in. And so many Sunday nights were spent eating dinner and debriefing about what had gone right and what had gone wrong with the service. Um, I have a picture, I think, of the building, if you haven't ever been there. It's a magnificent old building that is falling apart. And so as I walked to the restaurant and walked by this, I was hit by a wave of emotion as I remembered our first meetings that we held in that place. Another moment is when Eloise um, told Elisa, if you don't know Elisa, Elisa works with um, our kids department downtown and helps in our admin team, Um, but uh, she, Eloise adores Elisa, and um, she told Elisa that when I get to California, I'm going to take ballet, which is true. And then, and then she said, um, Elisa, you can come to all of my recitals. And, and when I heard her say that, it, 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 you know, I, just, I thought, how is Elisa going to afford all those flights? Because um, I can't pay for them. If anyone has frequent flyer miles, you want to donate to Elisa. This community has done such an incredible job of helping us raise up Eloise. She loves the church adores the church, asks constantly, is the church open? Because we've had to tell her when she asks on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday and Saturday if she can go to church. For whatever reason, we started telling her the church is closed, which is probably poor theology. (laughs) So she will ask on Sunday, is the church open yet? I love that. But there have also been moments of feeling like a failure. 
we started this community around the dining room table. I have a picture here. Of, this is one of the first, look at me without a beard. I look literally like I'm 12. I'm curious what I look like now without a beard. Um, this is the first gathering that we ever had around the table once we decided to launch. There had been some other meetings in our house, but we wanted to start in H Street, so I got a friend, um, convinced them to let me use their dining room. Our story was about feeling like people without a place, both a religious place to call home and a physical place to call home. The story behind the founding of our church is that we wanted to be a community that was worth staying for. I had planned to plant this community and then stay for the rest of my life. That was the vision. That was the goal. And I had tried so hard, but the harder I gritted my teeth and tried to make it work, the more harm that I did to myself and to my soul. I also feel like a failure in embodying the values of our community. At the core of who we want to be is a relational community that values authenticity, or put another way, a community that values vulnerability. But what I began to realize is I didn't know how to be in community well. I definitely didn't know how to be vulnerable. Everything in my life had formed me for the exact opposite. I felt like I'd failed at being a husband and the pastor that I'd wanted to be. And the problem is when you begin to focus on your failure, that the enemy, the accuser, will begin to flood your mind with all your other failures. And if you take a moment and think, all of us can come up with a list of things that we have failed at in life. And the accuser begins to say things like, you're nothing but a failure. And honestly, I was kind of feeling sorry for myself. And I was working on a list of charges and commissions that I wanted to give you, and the accuser kept saying, who do you think you are to give a charge? You're nothing but a failure. And then I felt God's voice say, in a really sweet way, who do you think you are? Get over yourself. I'm the God who specializes in failures. And then my mind began to be flooded with failures in Scripture. Abraham, we could literally take weeks going through his failures. Or Paul, who killed Christians. David, who let hubris go to his head. Peter, who at the most critical moment in his life, Peter, Peter denied Jesus, not one time, not two times, but three times. Elijah, after seeing one of the most amazing, miraculous events in his entire life, Elijah has a breakdown and hides in a cave and asks God to kill him. And then there's Jesus, because Jesus is the biggest failure of them all. We read the story of Jesus backwards. We know the end, but at the moment he breathed his last breath, even Jesus wondered if he had failed, if everything had been in vain, because Jesus was 100% human, and in his final moments, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that as he took his final moments on the cross that he had to wonder, did I fail? Is this all just a joke? Am I crazy? And then I felt God say, if you want to start a road towards vulnerability, tell people you feel like a failure. But then proclaim the goodness of the gospel over their life and over yours. Because my guess is, I'm not the only one who feels like a failure. I'm guessing a lot of you feel the exact same way. You feel a failure, like a failure because of a relationship that fell apart. Or you feel like a failure because you didn't get that job that you wanted. Or maybe you got fired. Or maybe you got passed over for a promotion that you would have been perfect for. Or maybe one of your best friends just downloaded on you and told you everything that is wrong with you. Or maybe you're like me and your time in D.C. is coming to an end and you had planned on staying here forever. I don't know what your failure is. But here's what I do know. Your story is still being written. 
Because we know that Jesus wasn't a failure, and we know that Paul wasn't a failure, and we know that Peter wasn't a failure, and we know that Elijah wasn't a failure, because we read these stories backwards. We read these stories on the other side of resurrection, and we know that the story doesn't end in failure. And what I want to proclaim, the word of hope that I want to proclaim to you this morning, is that your story and my story, they're still being written. And even your failures can be redeemed and your failures like your scars can become the most beautiful thing about you. I want to put a bookmark there or a pen. I'm really bad at expressions. Those of you who have been around for a while, I get up here and I'm searching for the words, the right expression, whatever it is. Just remember that piece about failure because I want to come back to it. But I first want to give you a charge, some challenges for the type of church that I hope you will continue to be. But before I move forward, I had a couple of the pictures I just want to show you real fast. Um, just for those of you who weren't around. Uh, I, so we had the picture of the first meeting, and then I forget what the next. Uh, let's go to the next one. That is the famous soup I used to talk about making um, and making the table home. And then I wanted to show you this one just so you can... This is the first worship service ever. I just love that photo. We, I, yeah, it, it feels like forever ago. And when I think back about that church and what that church has become and what that church will be in the future, here are the things that I hope it will continue to do. I want the table to continue to be a church that is committed to relationships, committed to community, continued to, committed to being with each other. Because there's a command from God that you love one another. John 13, 3, uh, or 34 through 35 says this, Love one another. Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And so my challenge is to stay in community, to love well, to make time for each other. Community takes commitment. Community takes time. You've got to schedule it. And I want the table to continue to be a community where we can weep together and laugh together and party together and enjoy the goodness of God's life. Because they will know us by our love. Second, I want us to pursue vulnerability. I know more than anyone how hard it is to be vulnerable. But also, as someone who is on the journey towards vulnerability, I know it's one of the most powerful things in your life. You've got to find a space and a people with whom you can take your mask off. Because it is through transparency and through vulnerability that we grow not only in our relationships with God, but also in our relationships with other people. Because what I found on my own journey towards vulnerability is that as I've learned to be vulnerable, I've also learned better how to be in community. Because it's hard to ever really be in community if you're not honest and real with the people you're in community with. I know this from experience. But next, I hope you continue to love Scripture. Don't give up on your thoughtful reading and appreciation of Scripture. Because yes, there are challenges. And sometimes we wonder if this ancient book holds up in our modern world. But I promise you that the words of Scripture are just as powerful today as when they are written. And not because they're in some sacred and holy book that we have called the Bible and put black leather around and embossed with gold lettering that says the Holy Bible. No. It's because those, the words contained within it revealed Jesus to us. The Old Testament points to Jesus and his ultimate mission. And, the, and in the New Testament, we get the witnesses of the people who walked with Jesus and who knew Jesus best. There's this, there's this verse um, in Ezekiel that I love. In fact, um, I gave our pastoral staff for Christmas Bibles with this passage in the front. It says this, and then he said to me, son of man, eat this scroll I'm giving you, eat the scroll I'm giving you and fill your stomach with it. So I ate it and it tasted sweet as honey in my mouth. 
Eat the scriptures. Meditate on the scriptures. It will provide nourishment and it will provide life. And I hope that through my preaching that I've instilled a love or at least a curiosity about the words in this ancient book we call the Bible. Because it has the power to shape your life in this community. But next, keep Jesus at the center. Because the power of Scripture is not that it's some ancient text with rules for how to live, but the power of Scripture is that it reveals Jesus to us. And in Jesus we see the face of God. Never stop preaching Jesus. Jesus is the hope of the world. And as I think about those of you in this room, I wrote in my notes as I look out on you in this room, but I can't see you. So as I think about those faces I saw before I went blind, I think about your stories of transformation. I think about the good news of Jesus and the power of his community and how through that you found new life, you found purpose, and you found friends for the journey. I know this because you sent me texts and emails and cards over the past month telling me your stories. As John says, study the scriptures diligently. These are the very scriptures that testify about me so continue to pursue Jesus continue to preach Jesus his life and Jesus death but most importantly continue to preach Jesus resurrection next I hope that we are a community that is led by the spirit continue to pursue the spirit's guidance in your life it is God's spirit that guides and transforms us and make us makes us look more like Jesus. This is why we hold 21 days of prayer. This is why we talk about praying first. I want you and our church to be sensitive to the leading of the Spirit because it is through the participation with the Spirit that we look more like Jesus and we have the mind of Christ. Paul says it this way, and we all who have unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory and are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. And then next, live sacrificially. Live your life for others and not for yourselves. Give yourself radically for the purposes of God. Give generously of your time and resources. Because the thing I realize as I get older and actually accumulate more things in life is that the things that are most valuable to me are not the things that I've accumulated the possessions, the finances, whatever it might be. But the things that are most valuable are the spaces where I've been generous, where I've given myself to others. And I have a final charge I want to give you, but before I give my final charge, I want to take a moment and just say thanks. And as I say thanks, I want to um, pray the words of Hebrews 6, 10 through 11 over you. It says this, God is not unjust and he will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. I love that verse. God will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. God sees your work. Not one act of service that you have done will go without notice. And let me just say on behalf of Charla and Eloise and myself that we will not forget your work. We will not forget your love. You are family and will always be our family. And to those of you who have prayed for us, thank you. And to those of you who have taken time to write cards and emails and letters telling us what the table meant to you, thank you. Thank you for loving me well Thank you for loving my family well during the good times and during the bad times. Thank you, as I said, for helping Eloise adore church. Thank you to the church aunties who are family to her. I'm terrible at emotions. 
I'm terrible at goodbyes. In fact, I felt like someone really got me at All In when Gretchen, who's head of our communion team, who my guess is like dislikes groups about as much as I do, she came up to me and said, when I saw that they were going to have a going away party for you, I thought, I wonder if Kevin will try to figure out a way to skip that. And I thought, you get me. You know, it was such a nice moment. It's always nice to feel like someone understands you. The emotions will come later for me. I practiced my whole life learning to be up front and to hold them back. I remember giving the eulogy at my dad's funeral and just not a single emotion. And then later that day, it all came. So I'll probably be sitting on 14th Street at a stoplight, sobbing and trying to hope that people don't notice in the car next to me. But I want to tell you how much I love you and how grateful I am for all of you. And being your pastor has been the joy of a lifetime. And I also want to say thank you to those of you who have given so much time and energy to lead this church and to make it possible. I'm sorry for the moments I took you for granted and didn't show gratitude. To those of you who have given hours to making this church possible, to those of you who show up early to set up and who clean up your house frantically and cook a meal so you can invite your dinner party over. To those of you who serve on worship and who get up early on Saturdays to provide food to our neighbors. I could literally just keep going down the list of the myriad of ways that you all serve. I want to say thank you. And my final charge is this. It's go. Don't be complacent. Continue to ask what God is doing in this city and then ask, how can I join with what God is doing? Because the best things, the most amazing things that the table has ever done had nothing to do with me. And instead, it had to do with members of our community who listened to God and who were willing to say yes. Because from day one, we've always said that we want to be a church that is built around the gifts of our community. Everything we need is already in this house. God is just waiting for people to say yes. Yes. And so we wanted to build ministry around the gifts and the passions of our community, around what God is saying to you. And then we wanted to find a way to empower you and to build you up so you could become leaders to live into that vision. And so my final charge to you this morning is that you go, that you ask, what is it that God is placing on my heart? What has God placed on it for a long time for some of you? What is that stirring that God is calling me to do, that passion that God is placing within me and how do I say yes? Because we as a community have existed from the beginning for those we have not yet met. We exist for the lost and the lonely. We exist for those without a friend or without purpose. We exist for those who have felt excluded and unwelcomed. We exist for those who aren't sure where their next meal is coming from. And so I don't know what the passion is that God has placed on your heart. Whether it's a passion for those without a home or those without food or the lonely or the excluded or the immigrant or the vulnerable. I don't know what that passion is. But I believe that God has put a passion and a calling on many of your hearts and you need to step out on, in faith and say yes. And I know that that's scary. How do I know it's scary? Because I have never been more scared in my entire life than the moment that I stepped out and planted the table church. And I also know it's scary because as I look towards July 1st, tomorrow, and think about what's next, I am scared to death. But anytime you take a major leap, there's always fear. But I also know that the greatest rewards in life come from taking leaps of faith. And one of the reasons that we are afraid is because we might fail. And so I want to return to that place that we put a bookmark. Chances are you might fail. You'll step out. Maybe you'll risk it all and you will fall flat on your face. 
But I believe that the God that we serve takes our failures and can transform them into something beautiful. Because the story of the table from the day we started is littered with mistakes and failures. But ultimately, it's a story of God's faithfulness and power. And I believe with all my heart that your church, that our church is just, the story of our church is just beginning to be written. And so my question to you is, what's your chapter in this story going to be? What are you going to say yes to? How is God going to impact Washington, D.C.? Or the neighborhood where you live? Or maybe some far off place that I don't even know about. How is God going to impact it? What story is being written because you said yes? And so this morning, I want to end with the words of Paul. Now, Paul was a church planter. But Paul would often travel from city to city planting a new church, and then he would take off and go on to the next space. But he actually stayed with this church in Ephesians for a fair amount of time, a couple years, and that day and age being what it is, Paul did not have an Instagram account, and so it was going to be hard to keep up with him. And, and so this passage, Acts chapter 20, is basically Paul telling every, this, this church that he'd planted and spent a few years with, I'm never going to see you again. And so in this passage, Paul gives his final talk. It's kind of like a sermon. It's kind of a talk. You should read it. Acts chapter 20. I thought about reading it to you this morning, but it's really self-righteous. Um, and I thought it really didn't... Like, Paul says these things like, I just want you to know that I was perfect in my time with you. I never coveted your clothes. And I thought, that's not true. There has been times I've coveted people's shoes. Anyway. And I was like, I can't read that to them. But I want to end with words of, the words of Paul. Paul says this. And now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. And so this morning I commit you to God and God's grace. I know that God is just beginning to get started with the table. And then in verse 36, we read this. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. And so this morning, as I end my official story at the table, um, one of my great honors is getting to pass on the role of lead pastor to Pastor Jessica during this transition period. And one of the things that I've always admired about Jessica was she was willing to say yes when God called. She said yes when we first asked her to serve with the smallest roles. She said yes when we asked her to help us launch a new location in Northwest D.C. And she said yes when we asked her to step into this next role as interim lead pastor. And so as my final act as lead pastor, I wanted to invite the trustees and the elders and the ministry directors and the pastoral staff, um, any of the coaches, any of the leaders that are at this location who are in this room. And I want us to come and to gather around Jessica and to lay hands on her and um, pray for her as she leads us into this next season. And then when we are done with that, um, she will, her first act will be leading us into communion. And so I'm just really excited. Um, and so would, would uh, those leaders come forward? And Jessica, would you come forward as well? You can stand right there on the spot of paint. I can it. Maybe I'm, it's all age. <laughs> we just gather around her. If you can get close enough, lay your hands on her. God, we just thank you for the life of Jessica. 
We thank you for the way that she loves you. We thank you for the way that she models your love and compassion and grace. And I pray that you would just empower her with your spirit, that you would give her wisdom as she leads this church during this interim period. I pray that you would give her wisdom and strength and courage to make the hard choices that she needs to make. And I pray that you would raise up leaders around her who would support her, who would be her armor bearers, who would be her, there for her in the moments of excitement to celebrate with her, but also will be there with her in those moments when things are not going as planned. And God, I just pray this morning that you would just settle on her in a special way. I pray that Jessica would feel your presence and your spirit in a way that she has never felt it before. And I pray that you would make clear the path before her. Guide her steps. Help her to know where to lead. And let her know that you are there with her every step of the way. And may she continue to empower leaders in this community to welcome new people into our midst. To continue to create a space for the lonely and the excluded and the vulnerable. Those who have no other home, may they find a spiritual home and a family here. In Jesus' name.